My grandma is probably the person that I admire the most and she sort of has shaped a lot of how I see life. And she has a saying that says that you have to be the best version of yourself in service to others. And I think that's how I want to live my life and hopefully when I'm gone, uh, that remains and that will be legacy for me. Welcome to the Leadership and Legacy podcast, where we interview inspiring CEOs, entrepreneurs, and software leaders who are building remarkable companies and legacies in the world. I'm your host, Austin Yoder, founder of Magrothea Partners, an entrepreneurial investment firm dedicated to acquiring and growing one great founder-owned software company. As part of my journey, I'm learning from inspiring leaders and builders and gathering the most valuable insights and advice I learn along the way here with you, my wonderful audience, so that we can all learn and lead better together. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope that you'll find as much value and insight in the show as I do. Mario, it's an honor to host you as my first ever guest on the Leadership and Legacy podcast. Full disclosure for our listeners, I'm incredibly lucky that you're one of my wonderful investors through Soralvo Capital. You have one of the most inspiring entrepreneurial stories that I know of, and I'm really excited to share that story with our audience today and to share some of your insights. So thank you so much for joining us today. On the contrary, thank you so much. It's an honor for me. As you know, I'm a huge fan of yours, so very happy to do this with you and, and super excited to be the first one. Thank you so much, Mario. Great. Well, let's let's dive in. I have a couple of questions. Um, to start, can you tell us a little bit about Bomi and how many years you were the CEO there? Yeah, so Bomi is the company that we acquired uh, through the search fund that I raised with my partner. Uh, we bought this company in 2011, and it is a company that was doing warehousing and distribution for the healthcare industry. So we're basically warehousing and distributing pharmaceutical products and medical devices. Uh, it is a company that back then had 185 employees. Uh, it was highly profitable. Uh, it was turning in a 32% EBITDA margin. Uh, and I got very lucky to find that business because more, more important than the numbers, he had a great culture. The entrepreneur was a person that I really cared about. He had a, an amazing business acumen and, and, and the business that we bought uh, had people who sampled, resembled sorry, the, the culture of the seller. So I got very lucky in that regard. I ended up running the company as CEO for almost five years. And, and then I stayed in the board after I sold it because we kept a piece of it. We sold it to a family office for five times the original investment. Uh, we invested $18 million in equity, ended up selling it for around $100 million, had a multiple expansion. We were able to grow the company around 30% a year. Um, and the business model was just great because it's a company that was growing. It has 100% recurring revenue. So you sign three to five year contracts uh, with your clients and it had a very high return invested capital because uh, it's very asset like. That's amazing. So you were growing 30% year over year for about five years. That's, a, yeah. that's an incredible growth right. story. Just to put some numbers around that, then r- roughly what was the revenue when you bought it? And then roughly what size was it in terms of revenue at exit? So we were able to grow the EBITDA more than the, more than the, than the revenue. It was yep. around 50 million pesos when we bought it and around 160 when we sold it. Uh, that's pesos, which probably back then uh, you would have to divide by 17 or so. I'd be very curious, what challenge, and I'm sure you overcame so many different challenges while you were leading Bomi, but is there a challenge that you're the most proud of overcoming while you were leading the company? Yeah, I think uh, it has to do with the culture of the organization. Uh, we were able to transition from a company that it was founded by an amazing entrepreneur. He stayed in my board and I, he was a big mentor of mine, but it was a very solar organization. The guy was, I mean, he had a, he has a huge personality. He's very experienced. And when I came in, I had to manage the business differently because I, uh, I was not a logistics expert. I had never had a, re- a direct report in my life. Uh, I was younger than most of my direct reports. So I needed to change the way that the company sort of evolved over time. When I came in, I started managing the business through consensus and became more a facilitator than, than, than the solar, uh, like the center of the organization. So I think what I'm most proud of is that it, it actually ended up working uh, and we were able to transition. And the way that we did that 
is through establishing a culture of meritocracy and also a culture of uh, behaving as a team. And I paid a lot of attention to culture. So I think that that was the main challenge. As I said, never had a direct report. Suddenly I had 185 employees. So the challenge was, how do I make sure that I become the leader of this organization? Because now that I've bought the business, there's people working for it. So now they work for me, but I have not recruited them in the sense that they want to work for me. So that was the most important challenge. We were able to achieve it. It has to do a lot with culture, compensation, and also with just recognizing that given that I did not have enough experience or knowledge about the industry, I needed everyone in the organization to be at their best and contribute what they could. I see. So it, it sounds like you inherited a strong culture, but you continued to build upon that foundation, empowering the employees in the organization, inspiring them to want to follow your leadership. Um, and that by the time you exited, you had really created a culture that you were very proud of. Yeah, we were able to retain, well, I was able to retain most of my direct reports and out of 10, only, only one of them changed because of a very specific reason. Uh, and we had a very strong team. Everyone was like very committed to the company. And I think that, that was the basis that allowed us to grow, to attract new clients and to have the service level uh, that the company had. Uh, we had a lot of focus in quality, a lot of focus in IT. And I think those were very important elements to, to attract and retain clients. Um, so speaking of clients, that's a great segue to my next question. Thank you for lining it up so nicely. Is there a, a story of customer success that you're especially proud of? Yeah. So the largest client of the company when, when we bought it was a client that just came in prior to, we, to, to the closing of the transaction. We made a mistake and the mistake was that I did not know the cost structure of the company and we ended up structuring an earnout with the seller that was only based on revenue. Uh, as I said before, you have three to five year contracts, you bring in a client and you're providing warehousing and distribution services for them. In this case, the client, it was a client called the Gaza, and what they do is that uh, they sold low value and high volume products. Uh, these are bandages and like sutures and alcohol, cotton, things like that. So what happened is that we brought this client. We were, the company was very good at servicing clients with high value products like diagnostics companies, for example, where you have the reagents, it's highly specific, uh, lots of temperature control products. When these high volume started coming in, we were, two things happened. One is that after we were able to do the math. We were losing money on the client because of the prices that the seller gave to the client. And the other thing, which was even worse than losing money for the client, is that our warehouse started being cramped because the high volume of these products was very disruptive for the operation. So we could not do what we were doing well for the other clients. We could not do it anymore. Uh, so it was highly distracting. Um, what I did is that given I recognizing that I did not know the operation well enough, I actually ended up after two months of operating, asking the former CEO to come in and join like as an interim CEO for a couple of weeks until we could solve the issues that we have with that client. He was partially mm -hmm. responsible, obviously, for making the client, but I sort of got out of the way. It was not easy because some of my employees did not like the fact that, that he was returning to the operations, my, my COO who had a different, a difficult relationship with him. Uh, but he came in, he knew what to do because he understood the processes very well. We were able to structure a plan. He started executing it. Obviously I was there sitting by his side to learn. And then he left and we were able to keep that client. Even though we were able to sort of operate with that client and the rest of our clients properly, we were still losing money. So after a year or so, it was a very difficult relationship because it was expensive for them and I was losing money. We were charging that client as a percentage of revenue. So I sat with them and I told, told them that we needed to terminate that relationship because it was not good for them or me. Uh, and I think just the fact that I was very open to them made a huge difference. And I told them, guys, mm -hmm. like, I'm not trying to screw you or anything. Let's open the books. I'll give you a, a cost plus structure. You can audit everything that I do. Let's hire a consultant together. 
Uh, and let's try to make it work as partners. It's not a supplier-client relationship in which I'm trying to reach out to your pocket and take your money. I mean, I'm just trying to do what's right. We have a five-year contract. We can just cancel the contract if it's not working. Let's open the numbers and let's see if we can make it work. We worked that way. We ended up through working with a consultant and because we were completely honest about the operation, we were able to find a lot of uh, possibilities to increase the profitability of the business. I don't want to bore you with details, but I'll give you, I'll give you an example. We found that out of uh, 1,500 SKUs that they have, only 250 were making for 90% of the revenue. So all the others were just sitting idle in my warehouse. Obviously, I had to charge for that, but it was not generating revenue. So when they would look at the cost of the revenue, at the cost of logistics, sorry, as a percentage of the revenue, it was a huge number. But it, it is because we're carrying all those in, like inefficiencies. So we ended up restructuring that. We ended up restructuring the size of the shipments in order to make it more profitable. Um, obviously, that, that had a lot of implications because now you have to talk to commercial and tell them that they can not only sell what they want, but they need to sell above a, th a certain threshold. But we worked together and then we were able to keep that client for, for the next 10 years uh, until I left the company. What a great story. And what I'm hearing, just to play that back to you, as you kind of recognize a, a problem and a challenge, you're at the point of maybe terminating a client relationship, but you know, you took some entrepreneurial initiative and you treated them with total honesty and transparency. You opened up the books, you treated them as a partner. And because of that spirit of partnership, they wound up staying for another 10 years with you and your relationship was actually able to grow when at first you were thinking about maybe you have to terminate it. Yeah. And, and not only that, it, I was able to completely redefine the culture of the organization based on that experience because then we realized that if we behave as partners of our clients, we could find these opportunities to reduce the cost for them while increasing the profitability for us. And that's what we started doing. So I, we designed a business intelligence that we would share with our clients so that they could see the frequency, the size of the shipments, and we would analyze that information once a quarter. And, and we found a lot of opportunities to, to improve our profitability while reducing cost. And that would allow us to renew contracts without the pressure of discounts. I love that. You were creating win-win situations in partnership with your clients. That's the, be that's the exactly. best outcome. That's amazing. That's a um, very, very nice way to, to summarize it. So Mario, as you know, our audience here is CEOs, software leaders, and young entrepreneurs who aspire to be CEOs and leaders in the future. Um, with that audience in mind, guess what would be your best advice for sales? I think the best advice for sales, and it might be a cliche, but is to listen to your client, to be humble about it, to, to, to sit in front of them and really try to understand their needs. It's very common that we come with a certain thing that we want to sell to someone until you understand what they need. It's very difficult to be effective in, in selling. So as I joined the business, I, I became the main salesperson in the organization, even though I knew nothing about the business. And for me, uh, that was a, a great advantage in retrospect because I was able to ask honest questions. And also, people were not expecting me to have the answers. So I could just be naive uh, and not feel uncomfortable. So what I would do is I would sit with, my, with, with clients and try to understand what they needed. Also, I think the fact that we were signing three to five year contracts with our clients made it very important for us to really dig deep in understanding, are we a good match for this client? Because otherwise it becomes a nightmare. I mean, long-term contracts are very good when you are able to execute them well. They are terrible when you, when you have difficulties uh, executing what you promised. So you really want to make sure that you understand. Uh, that played out very well for us, but I also think that it is the best way, not only to sell, but also to understand if you need to restructure your value proposition to do more R&D in your product. And then if you need to make any changes or not, if you can increase prices, if there are opportunities for off-selling, I think by listening no? and, and just by being around, what made a big difference is not to be the cheapest, but to be the best at what we were doing. So we'll come in and try to really have a, a differentiated value proposition based mainly in quality and IT. So I think when you have a clear value proposition, it also makes it a lot easier to sell. And then 
sort of having a feedback loop that allows you to come back and redefine what the value proposition should be is key, no? And, and companies are alive and you have to be iterating. Hi, it's Austin, your host, with a brief interruption. Since this podcast is free and not supported by ads, I have a very quick ask for you. If you're finding value in this conversation, please consider sharing it with another leader or aspiring leader who you think would enjoy it so that we can learn and lead better together. And if you're a software founder considering a successful exit to a partner who will love your team just as much as you do, I would love to hear from you. Please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or send me an email at austin at magrathiapartners.com. That's austin at magrathia, M-A-G-R-A-T-H-E-A, magrathiapartners.com. Thanks, and now back to the show. That's great. So to, to listen, to actively listen, and to use every interaction with your clients as an opportunity to learn more about their needs and consider deeply how can you provide more value to them and be the best at providing the most value. Exactly. So you spent so much time and focus on building a great culture. For our audience, what would be your best advice for managing people? So I think it, it all starts with setting expectations. You want to make sure that people understand what they're expected to do, how success looks like in, in this organization. And I think that comes with having whatever kind of KPIs, uh, OKRs, I mean, however you want to call it, but you want to make sure that people understand how they're going to be measured, what they need to do and how it's going to be measured. And then also that they are compensated for, for being successful. I think variable compensation attached to KPIs is like the perfect formula because it allows for people to understand what they need to do. And then if they do it, they get a reward. So it aligns the incentives. And I think alignment is, is key for success. The other mm -hmm. thing that it, I think it's very important and it has an exponential effect is to focus on culture. I think culture comes from the top uh, and culture is very much who you hire, who you promote and who you fire and also uh, how you compensate. No, So I think if you put these two together, it allows you to have a like a flywheel effect uh, that even if you're not interacting with people directly, they know what to what is expected in terms of how they behave. And I think that's the best way that you can manage people. The other thing that I think it's very important is to empower people. We mentioned this before, but people want to be where they can actually contribute something. In my case, it was easy because, I, as I said, I did not have experience or knowledge about the industry. So I was just a facilitator. But I've discovered, because I've been a CEO twice also in the diagnostics business, that when you allow for people to bring in their ideas to sort of contribute and you ask questions instead of trying to have the answers because I'm the boss and I'm going to have the answers. But if you like reach out to people and, and listen to them and, and put what they're saying into, into practice, I think it's a great way to, to, to manage people and get the most out of them. Um, and also, I mean, something that I do personally and I'm a big fan of is just enjoying the ride. I think people want to have fun as well. So like if we're winning, let's just, let's just have fun. No? And, and not take ourselves too seriously because I mean we we we're, we're all here to to enjoy it and and have fun and and we don't have to stress that much. And as someone who's been fortunate to spend some time with you and get to work with you, I agree. You guys do have a lot of fun along the way, so it's not <laughs> yeah. not surprising to to hear that that's such an important element of managing people too. So okay, so you had this amazing journey. You created a great culture. Then, you know, you came to a point where you and your partners were ready to exit. After you exited, you joined this community of entrepreneurs and investors, and you're contributing now on the investing side, mentoring and coaching a lot of young entrepreneurs like myself and others. I would just be curious, after the sale, as you've joined this community, is there a, a story about working with and mentoring a young entrepreneur that's brought you joy? Yeah, there's many. Uh, I, I just chose one for this conversation, but I have to tell you that part of the things that I enjoy the, enjoy the most is interacting with people. Like these are entrepreneurs, but we have the benefit of interacting with amazing people, like second to none, best in class, and just having the opportunity to listen to your story, like people like your story. I, I'm a huge fan of underdogs. Uh, there's many underdogs in the in the ATA world, people that probably came from underprivileged backgrounds and then made it 
somehow they were successful in life. And just listening to those stories is what really moves me. So, and there's others who want to change the world, want to make a difference. They want to manage people to sort of drive behavior. They, they, they want to contribute something different. And that's super exciting to me. The, the, the example that I chose is one with Pedro Rivera, who's a guy who did ETA. He was he does not come from a traditional background because he was doing marketing for Nestle. We usually sponsor MBAs from, from top business schools. It was not his case. So obviously he had some, I mean, operational experience, but he lacked the deal making experience. So I was able to work with him very closely. I was able to introduce him to the investors in the community so that he could raise his fund. And then after he raised his fund, help him analyzing which industries to to explore because I'm a huge believer that it, what matters most is that you choose the right business model. Uh, you know that Buffett says that when an industry with a bad reputation meets a manager with good reputation, it's the industry that goes with its reputation untouched. It is the same the other way. Like I do think that entrepreneurs who ended up finding good business models, good industries, uh, have done half of the work and then uh, it's not as difficult uh, as it seems. Uh, but I introduced him to some industries. Then we structured the transaction together, helped him with networking, uh, also to find a seller. And then I joined his board. And today I think that company is probably around six times the money in, in gross return after six years if we would sell the company today. But not only that, I think the future for that company is very promising. It's a company that does telematics uh, for, for uh, like, uh, transportation companies in, in Mexico. Uh, and I think with AI and security issues and the need to improve the cost of the supply chain uh, in our country and others, plus the new shoring tailwinds and everything, it's positioned to, to keep growing at the rates that it has or even faster. Uh, and it's just super exciting to, to be a part of it. Uh, it has also been super joyful. I really enjoy interacting not only with the entrepreneurs, but also with the board members. We have an amazing board, one of the businessmen, businessmen in Mexico that I admire the most, super high ethics, Andrew Saltun that you know very well, the, the Chains, Mark McKinsey, who's an expert in the industry. So it's been a lot of fun. Uh, and I, I think what, when I was thinking about this question and just thinking about why it's exciting, it's because I think winning is very exciting. No, And just to feel that like you are contributing a little bit so that someone realizes their dreams, becomes successful, and changes the life, the lives of others. I think in my experience, what I enjoy the most about being a CEO is that you put yourself in a position where you can really make a difference to others. So enabling people to do that is exciting. I love that. Yeah. So you you know, as you joined this community, you were able to have impact, you know, and, and helping Pedro establish himself, he's gone on to do wonderful things with your support, of course. And I love this. I mean, some of my favorite examples of founders who decide to sell are the founders who come back and participate in this community, who you know join boards where they feel like they have the energy and desire to do that, uh, where they can continue to make an impact just like you did with Pedro. Um, so I think it's, it's really powerful. And I just want to highlight that you know, there is this community of entrepreneurs and it's also great when a, a founder wants to go and sail off into the sunset and spend time on the beach with their family. But for, for people who are thinking about how to, to give back, um, there is this very ready-made community that they can plug into and contribute their knowledge and experience, um, just like you did with Pedro there. Last two questions here. Is there a question that I should have asked that I didn't ask? Yeah, so I think two that came to mind is one, how do you balance work and personal, right? Because the the journey of a CEO it's very demanding. And it's great because you can sort of decide how to allocate your time, which your priorities are going to be, but it's also very demanding because you can delegate authority, but you cannot delegate responsibility. You know, the responsibility is for that person to have and it cannot be delegated. So I think you have, yeah, the benefit of deciding how to allocate your time, but also a fiduciary obligation that it's huge. So I do a lot of thinking around four dimensions, which is spiritual, mental, social, and health, and my health, and obviously 
family uh, including included in all of those categories uh, so i think that's an interesting question how do you balance that just to say it rapidly i think everyone does it differently but i think you do want to pay attention to all of these and sort of the way that i think about it is like you if you pay, start paying attention more to one and the other, probably the other section struggles. No? So if you're paying too attention to your social life, maybe spiritual is what you're missing, or you're probably compromising health. And then if you do pay a lot of attention to working out, then maybe you're not socializing as much. So I think balance is very important. And I think that's a good question to ask always to, to people like, how do, you, how do you balance that out? And then the earth question that could potentially be interesting is prices that that came out of having a successful experience and like a successful journey. For me, is just a couple that I thought about is that imposter syndrome never goes away. <laughs> like having a CEO twice, both have been a very good experience. If you ask me today, I do not really know how to operate. Uh, and then also that money, that money is a byproduct, but it's not as important and it just... Uh, money is just an element that allows you to focus a little bit more, to, to have some peace of mind, and and to focus to to focus on things that really matter now because you've sort of taken that out of the equation so that you can now really focus on okay what's really important, uh, and that money is just an element that allows you to have more uh, to focus a little bit more on the cans than the haves so it's not that i have to do this is that i have the opportunity to do this so now i have like i can travel a little bit more i can go to other places maybe eat at better restaurants uh, provide for my family in a different way um, and and i have probably less haves that i have to do something that i do not like no but those are two that came to mind that's super helpful thank you and and we always close on the topic of legacy here at the leadership and legacy podcast so my closing question to you mario is what does legacy look like for you my grandma is probably the person that i admire the most and she sort of has shaped a lot of how i see life and she has a saying that says that you have to be the best version of yourself in service to others and i think that's how i want to live my life and hopefully when i'm gone uh, that remains and that will be legacy for me. But however, that is achieved or expressed. I do think that we're in this life to make a difference to others. And, and the more lives that we can impact and the more that we can pay it forward, the more that we I can achieve that mission of contributing to others. And it also goes to say that I have to be the best version of myself. So I need to work on me every day because that allows me to have a larger impact, no? I love that. Be the best version of yourself in service to others. Yeah, that's, yeah, hopefully. <laughs> that's the idea. Amazing. <laughs> I think that that's the perfect place to, to end the show for today. What an inspiring note to leave us with. And yes, and may we all be the best versions of ourselves in service to others. Cheers Mario, to that. Mario, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, indeed, cheers to that. This really was a lot of fun. I can't wait to share this and your insights with our audience. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Austin. Un abrazo. Un abrazo. <laughs>